Good morning. My name is Emily Stoper, and I'm a worship associate for today. On behalf of our guest minister, the Reverend Sarah Skorchko, worship producer, Vincent Rains, musician, Renee Witten, and others on the worship team, we welcome you to worship with us at the First Unitarian Church of Oakland. Please turn your camera off while we begin, while we, we, we begin our service and light our chalice and candles. This will allow us to begin with a quiet space. We will turn our cameras on to greet each other later in the service. Please note that we are recording this service. So if you don't want to be in the recording, please keep your camera turned off. For best viewing experience, we recommend that you make certain you have the up-to-date version of the Zoom app on your computer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Claudia Morgan and I am a member of the Board of Trustees and we're glad you're here. I will tell you that I'm at somebody else's house and they do have dogs barking and I apologize for that. We are an intentionally multi-generational, multiracial, multicultural, inclusive and anti-oppressive religious community. You are welcome here. We invite you to fill out the guest connection card you will see in the chat. We want you to be able to support your exploration of what's available in our community that interests you and how we might participate. Welcome. Now, before we get, begin the service, we have a few reminders that are up on the screen. Today, starting at 12.30, the Earth Justice Advocates are going to be getting together for uh, talking about a all church picnic in August and the Bay Area Quality Board Accountability. They join us using the Zoom link in the chat. So look over in your chat. The Church Book Club meeting, and that will be, the book is The Human Age, The World Shape by Us by Diane Ackerman. And contact the email bookgroup at uuoakland.org for the Zoom link. That'll be on Thursday, July 22nd. The next Sunday, the Board of Trustees meeting, which is always a good time and very informative. So all of our members and friends are invited to attend. To receive the meeting link, email yesplease at uuoakland.org with board meeting in the subject line. And just to remind you that uh, we will have a 15 minute period uh, where anyone can ask questions or get clarification about what's going on in the church and then we will start our board meeting. And as you can see at the bottom, for more information, visit the online calendar here at uuopen.org slash calendar. And again, for Zoom link details, email yesplease at uuopen.org. Thank you very much. And there are the dogs. Okay, now for the chalice lighting. In Unitarian Universalist churches, it is our custom to light a chalice when we come together for worship, to sanctify the space we share for this hour. I invite you to, chalice, to light a chalice at home if you have one. If you don't, please know that the chalice is lit by your beloved fellow church members, glow brightly enough to hold you in their light. And by this shared light, we are made one. Our chalice lighting words today come from Betsy Darr, who writes, may the light of this chalice give light and warmth to our community when we are joyful and when we despair. And may we feel the warmth spread from our circle to wider and wider circles until all know they belong to one circle of life. Let us worship. And now we will together say the words on the slide as Stefan lights our Black Lives Matter candle. We light this chalice in recognition of the Black Lives Matter movement. We commit to dismantling with daily action the systemic racism that tries to deny the full humanity of Black people. Okay, next is our peace candle. Our quote for the peace candle today is from George Michael. You'll never find peace of mind 
until you listen to your heart. We begin today with a reading from our guest minister, the Reverend Sarah Skachko. Reverend Skachko attended Miguel Lombard Theological School and has an MFA in poetry. She served as the coordinator of outreach and engagement at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene, Oregon, and now lives in Austin, Texas. Welcome, Reverend Skachko. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm so glad to be joining you again for worship from Austin, Texas. This morning, our service is titled The Ship of Theseus, and it's an exploration of identity, in particular, how identity endures in a world that is forever changing, in a world where we know everything is impermanent. How do we consider who we are throughout our changing lives? Our reading today comes from Douglas Adams, who described coming into contact with a different understanding of permanence and impermanence than his Western one, the one he was used to as an Englishman. And he realized during this encounter, the limitations of his view. He writes, I remember once in Japan, having been to see the Golden Pavilion Temple in Kyoto and being mildly surprised at how well it had weathered the passage of time since after all, it had been built in the 14th century. I was told it hadn't weathered well at all and had in fact been burnt to the ground twice in this century. So it isn't the original building, I had asked my Japanese guide. But yes, of course it is, he insisted, rather surprised at my question. But it's burnt down, I asked. Yes, he answered. Twice, I said. Many times, he replied. And rebuilt, I asked. Of course, it is an important and historic building, he said. With completely new materials, I asked. But of course, he responded, it burnt down. So how can it be the same building, I asked. It is always the same building, he said. I had to admit to myself that this was a perfectly rational point of view. It merely started from an unexpected premise for me. The idea of the building, the intention of it, its design are all immutable and are the essence of the building. The intention of the original builders is what survives. The wood of which the design is constructed decays and is replaced when necessary. To be overly concerned with the original materials, which are merely sentimental souvenirs of the past, is to fail to see the living building itself. And so Douglas Adams writes, and so dear ones, I invite you into perhaps different ways of understanding this morning, this beautiful morning on which we worship together. Our opening hymn is number 389, gathered here, led by your own chancel choir. And please know you're welcome as always to sing along at home as long as you stay muted and know that many others in your church are singing with you. Come, let us sing together. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour,
I love that song. And now we have one of my favorite parts of the service, greeting our neighbors. Please unmute your microphones, turn on your cameras and greet your neighbors. I suggest you switch to gallery view so you can see everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, I'm Jay. Emily, good, morning, good job Ron. there on the Hi, MJ. candles reading. Hi, Hi, Palace. Hi, Danny. Hi, Kim. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Carol. Anna and George and gorgeous. Hi, Hi Ron. Hi, MJ. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hi, Hi, Carol. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Carol. Hi, MJ. Hi, Mary. Hi, 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 Donna. Like every daughter here. Hi, Mary. Uh, hi, Evelyn. Hi, Dick. Hi, what are you Jane. doing, Corliss? Hi, Mary Jane. Hi. hi. Corliss, what are you doing? She's cooking us something. Cooking us something. Chopping vegetables. <laughs> Chopping vegetables. All right. Okay. Hi, Kimi. Hi, Kimi. Hi, Tom. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, okay. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, Dick. Hi, Dave. Hi, there. Okay, that's all, folks. Yes. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Hello, Emily. Now let's let's sit back and listen to a wisdom story from Reverend Scott Cope. Our story for today is a question, really. It's a thought experiment and one of the oldest in Western philosophy. Some of you will be familiar with it. I want you to imagine. Imagine we're all on a big wooden ship instead of together on a Zoom call. Imagine that this ship has tall masts and sails and wooden planks for the decks. And of course, such a wooden ship requires regular maintenance. So every couple days as we're sailing, we remove whatever the oldest plank is, the old rotten planks, and we replace it with a new one. Whatever the weakest plank is, we take it out, we put in a fresh board. So the ship is always in pretty good shape. And whenever we make it back to our home port, we toss those old ragged rotten wooden boards into a pile on the dock and we pick up a fresh stack of lumber in case we need it. Now imagine that after a few years, every plank on the ship has been replaced. And the question is, is it still the same ship? If none of the original lumber remains, are we still on the same boat? Now imagine, what if, what if someone took that pile of old ratty lumber that we had discarded and used it to build a second ship out of the original lumber? Imagine that they put every plank back in the place it had been. All the boards on the deck were back on the deck. All the boards on the side were back on the side. Which is the original ship now? Is it the ones that the sailors never left? but that's made out of all new lumber? Or is it the one where all the original lumber that was originally present is back in the shape it used to be, but which had slowly moved out from around the sailors? It's called the ship of Theseus problem. And philosophers and theologians have been trying to come up with an answer to the ship of Theseus problem for thousands of years. If we think about it, it can be applied to many aspects of human life. It has been said, of course, that no one can step into the same river twice. If you have a picnic every year on the same shady bend in a river, for instance, after 20 years, is it still the same spot? If the trees that covered you in shade back then have all fallen down and new ones have sprung up? Well, if it's not the same spot, then how do you know where to put your picnic blanket every year? And what about ourselves, with our cells changing, always replacing themselves, are we still the same people? If almost none of our original cells remain, what if our house changes from around us, our job, our career? What if the people around us change as those we love fall away over the years and new people join our lives? Are we still the same people we were 50 years ago if no one remembers who we were then? Is it enough to have the same captain piloting the ship, so to speak? That's the question 
and it has religious implications. But that is for you to ponder, and that is our story for today. Every summer, when I was between the ages of five and 13, I lived in a place called Three Arrows. Back then, in the 1950s, Three Arrows was a rather unique cooperative community based on the principles of democratic socialism. It consisted of 75 families on 125 hilly acres, about 50 miles north of New York City, where I lived the rest of the year. Three Arrows was an enormous influence on my values. From my parents, who did not have professional jobs or satisfying careers, Three Arrows was the main source of meaning and pride in their lives. That magnified its influence on my life. It was there that I learned to cherish community. Community is a place to build lasting friendships, to serve others without pay, and to learn to enjoy the arts, especially theater and folk dance in my case. I also learned that one of my jobs in life was to build a more just and peaceful world. And many Three Arrows members were teachers, so it wasn't surprising that I eventually became one. Nearly everyone in Three Arrows lived in conventional families. Divorce was rare. So I was set up for marrying young, having children, and staying married, all of which I did. Three Arrows still exists, and many of the children I grew up with still belong to it, and so do their children and grandchildren. But when I moved to California at the age of 25, I had to leave Three Arrows, so I lacked and I lacked a new community that would sustain the values Three Arrows had taught me. For years, I was too busy with career and children and, and activism in the women's movement to think much about community. The women's movement, by the way, was a natural for me since the women of Three Arrows were such a stark, smart, strong, and rather assertive bunch. Gradually, I became more involved with communities through my colleagues, my neighbors, my children's schools, my folk dance club, et cetera. But none of those offered me the kind of personal support and strong values Three Arrows had given me. I joined this church and became a Unitarian Universalist, which I call UU, of course, uh, 21 years ago at age 57. As soon as I joined, it was like a bell rang in my head. And I realized I'd found the community I hadn't even realized I was looking for. I knew right away that I wanted to be really active in the congregation, to find ways to serve, and to make lots of friends. I became engaged in the justice work, in adult religious education as teacher and student, in pastoral work, and much more. Finally, something had filled that big hole left by my leaving Three Arrows. It hadn't occurred to me earlier to find it in a religion since socialist Three Arrows held religion in contempt. But to my surprise, I had found a religion that embodied Three Arrows values. In many ways, UU Oakland offers more than Three Arrows did. Three Arrows was open to people of different classes since it was designed to be affordable, but it was all white. Everybody favored integration in the abstract but there's no effort to reach out to black people or other people of color. Obvious racist remarks were taboo, but no one gave any thought to our own racial attitudes and behavior. As a community, we didn't engage in political activity, but we did have programs to educate ourselves on political issues. So UU Oakland goes beyond my childhood socialization, but Three Arrows values provided the basis for my adult development. But unlike Three Arrows, this congregation didn't offer many opportunities to work in the arts. Crafts and folk dance had flourished in Three Arrows back in the 50s. Adults in the community had actually put on four original musicals every nine week summer. Not surprisingly, a few years later when I retired, I started taking classes at Stagebridge, Sagebridge, Oakland's wonderful senior theater community. Well, I'm still doing that after 15 years. The Three Arrows heritage endures. 
What I learned in that childhood community has enabled me to find fulfillment in this church and in other ways. It provided a foundation of values and commitments for a great deal of what I've become and the way I've spent my life. I've moved beyond it in some ways, but it will always be with me. Dear ones, I invite you now to join in prayer, meditation, or silent contemplation as we hold these in our care. Spirit of life and love, eternal mystery that surrounds and unites us all, be with us now as always. Be with our loved ones also. Return to us those who are missing. Return to health and safety those who are injured. Be with our loved ones near and far, both here in America and beyond our borders. Spirit of life, we also thank you for this chance to be together. We thank you for new jobs, new opportunities, for all that gives life beauty and meaning. We are grateful. This we pray. Amen and blessed be. I invite you now as we continue holding these dear ones in our hearts, in our loving care and our prayers, I invite you into a time of reflection as we listen to True Story by Barbara Higby, performed by Renee Witten.
Thank you, Renee, for the gift of music. Have you ever discovered something that's so fascinating online that you fall down the internet rabbit hole and wind up reading the entire archive. And the next thing you know, you're an expert in how many different types of toucans there are or what the word for dumpling is in every language, or you know the entire history of bread, which you never knew was so interesting. That's what happened to me when I discovered the Stuffed Animal Hospital blog. Formerly a children's librarian, Beth Karpis has been a doll maker for over 30 years now, and she specializes in stuffed animal repair. Since 2014, she's been documenting a few of the most drastic cases every month and posting photos of this online. Her patients are all over the map. Oliver the otter, Raj the tiger, Heartbreaker the hippo, an owl held together by safety pins. Many of the stuffed animals have either been shredded by a family dog or run over by a lawnmower. Three teddy bears arrived on the same day once, all without noses. Musty and Snuffles were both damaged during flooding from Hurricane Harvey. A roadrunner came in with a broken tail. One of the oldest, a teddy bear from 1927, had paw pads that had worn out, probably from hugging. Something unexpected shines through the Stuffed Animal Hospital blog. It's that these objects mean so much to their owners, so much that they don't seem to be treated like objects at all. Often people send their stuffed animals with another stuffed animal to keep it company in the box while it's being shipped. Children will send their stuffed animals with letters and hand-drawn illustrations of them and their favorite stuffy together in better days. Come back soon, Snakey, the letters say, or they send it with a small blanket to keep it warm. Some poke air holes in the box. Adults do this too. According to Beth, many customers say things like, I know it's only a stuffed animal, but it means the world to me. Or if I had to save one item in a fire, it would be my teddy bear. Or I'm 65 years old and this doll is still my most treasured possession. Even if the fur can be salvaged on these old stuffed animals, most of them wind up needing a full stuffing transplant. The stuffing gets old and crusty, but some of them, in addition to needing a full stuffing transplant, also need all of their fur replaced. You see where this is going. As you can imagine, this can be existentially distressing to the owners of these stuffed animals. Is Inchi, the stuffed inchworm, still Inchi? If you've replaced every part of the inchworm, this, again, is someone's most treasured possession. They're linked to their childhood. It can be pretty fraught. So Beth takes extreme care to involve owners in every step of this process, making sure they choose the closest fabrics and they get to decide whether and how much to replace. Being able to make those decisions does seem to help, but there's something else that Beth does. For every stuffed animal that she does extensive repairs to, Beth will take some of the original stuffing from the center of the stuffed animal, and she stuffs it into a little heart that she sews. And then she places that into the middle of the reconstructed stuffed animal. When I first saw Beth Karpis's heart solution, I thought, oh my God, she solved the ship of Theseus. Thank you for bringing a part of my past back to life, wrote one owner of a 50 year old rainbow dragon who was now breathing new flames of red and orange felt. The dragon had a little rainbow heart filled with the original stuffing deep inside the new dragon and not much else was the same. It seems that for the thing to be the same, it doesn't necessarily have to have all the same material 
from the past or even most of it. It has to carry forward something in its heart. It has to preserve some of the essence of its identity, if not the material of its identity at its core. And of course, in English, the word core comes from the old root word for heart. Someone who remembers this stuffed animal has to be able to believe at least emotionally that as far as it matters to them, this is the same in the core in the heart, in some essential way that matters. Think back to that original ship example. So many arguments about the ship of Theseus have to do with the wood and how the wood gets changed. But I wonder about the sailors, the living, breathing heart of the ship, the people who invented the ship, the people for whom the ship exists. What if they never got off the ship? even as the boards were slowly replaced around them, could you convince them really that they were no longer on the same ship when they still climbed into the same bunk every night, perhaps above or below one of their friends, when they still tucked their shoes into the same cubby, in the same place where they remembered having done it so many times they could do it in the dark or with their eyes closed. When they themselves chose the new boards, and subsumed the changing surface of the ship into their memory and their understanding of the ship, into their experience of the ship over time. Imagine the person who picnics every year at that bend in the river I talked about, forming new memories of how this tree leans and leans and falls and gets replaced, or how many flowers there are, how the daisies have really spread to the other bank of the creek. Is their experience and memory and observation not the heart of continuity, the heart of what this place is, this changing landscape? And in a church, in a church where new members constantly join and old members fall away, such that any year the whole church body might look completely different than it did 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago where the building itself might be renovated, or the congregation might move, the hymnals might change or need to be updated. Doesn't each of us, doesn't each of us serve as part of that heart, the beating heart of continuity that is memory and experience and consciousness? Doesn't each of us testify to the fact that yes, the church has changed and yet it is the same. Truly then, to journey together with a group of people for any length of time, to be together with these ones, sharing in the experience of this time, is that not a great privilege, a joy and an honor? We just made it through a year and a half long pandemic. Those of us who remain here, who have made it, what a journey this has been. What an incredible and stressful and unusual time this has been. One we are not likely to forget. Thinking back now, it, it can prompt poignant reflection of the way things were back then, before. I think when churches reopen, there will have to be some reflection each of us does about who is not here anymore and how things have changed, how things have had to change. I think that reflection can often be stressful, but generative. We as religious people take note all the time in holidays and rituals. We remember who was there, who is not, and who now is. I once asked my uncle Harry when he was dying about his aunts and uncles, trying to know some of his memories while I still could. What were my grandparents and their siblings like? And he told me something out of the blue that might not be true for you, and I'm not sure it's true for me, but it certainly was true for him, and it made me think. Uncle Harry said, you know, the best time of your life is when you're young and all the aunts and uncles are still around. When everyone who was already in the world when you were born is still in it, and you assume that they always will be. When you know everyone there is to know and the entire cast of characters is familiar to you. 
and you know your place in it. Uncle Harry died in 2016, and I've often thought back to what he told me and what it means about who we are. Are we still ourselves when the people we're surrounded by have changed? Of course, they are always changing. Are we still ourselves when the people who remembered who we were are no longer there to remind us and to remember? Are we still our parents' children after they have died? Is there some heart of continuity within ourselves? In the philosophy of the mind, all of this is a big problem, whether we are the same people we were in the past. There are so many stages of life that wind up being opportunities to take stock of who we are, where we've been, what we are doing now, and who we want to be going forward. I think we're in the middle of one of those basically for the entire world right now. Who are we becoming? Who are we unbecoming? What planks in the ship do we need to replace now or want to replace? What planks are no longer serving this ship? What heart of stuffing? do we choose to retain? What do we take forward? I'm reminded again of the Buddhist concept of anatta, that there is no fixed, permanent, unchanging self. There is none. Everything, including us, is always in a state of change. And I think that one of the understated joys of life is the privilege of being alive through time to witness the ebb and flow of things and their identities. The sacred blessing of memory that helps form a heart of continuity. I return always to that Alan Watts quote that we are the universe perceiving itself. And I think that each through line of continuity that each of us is, each fragment of the divine whole, each corner of the ever-changing universe as observed is holy, which means that the chance to experience, experience anything for however long or short, the chance to witness the changing of planks and to remember is an incredible gift. Now at this stage of your life, how will you flourish into your truest self? How will you honor the experiences you've had as Emily described in her reflection? What will you bring forward from when you were younger? How will you melt that with what you do in the future? What will you choose to hold on to? Which old planks will you replace? Which new ones will you welcome into your understanding of self? Which rabbit holes of exploration will you fall down? Learning about every species of toucan, for instance, or the entire history of bread. What childhood treasures will you hold tightest? And which of those that belong to your fellow travelers will you honor? My wish for each of you, for each of us, is the wonder and delight of seafaring aboard a ship of your own making in these most sacred waters we share. Amen and blessed be. Wow, what a wonderful sermon. At every service you attend, you're asked to donate money to this congregation and you know it's coming. I'm about to do that. I know why I donate money to our congregation. I'm grateful for a million things about it. But most of all, for the sense of being part of a warm, supportive community. I feel that strongly in my covenant group and at the joyful women's retreat and whenever I give or receive pastoral care and in a spiritual sense, every time I participate in one of our beautiful communions. But I'm asking you to consider what you're grateful for about our congregation. Is it the beauty of the building? Is it the friendships you've made? Is it the music? Is it our children's programs? Is it the weekly infusion of inspiration that is our Sunday services? Is it the courses you've taken? Is it our work for justice and for the environment? 
Is it our anti-racism work? Is it things I haven't mentioned at all? Just please take a few seconds to think of what you're grateful for. Okay, now consider that it takes money to sustain all of those blessings. And please find a way to give generously from among the choices for giving you see on the slide. We will now have a brief musical inter interlude. So during that music, go do it now. Go make your donation. From you I receive to you. I give together we share and by this we live from you I receive to you I give together we share and by this we live Now please join me in saying the Congregational Commitment, which you should see on your screen. To the work of the church, which is weaving a tapestry of love we call community, we dedicate ourselves and these our offerings. And now we will sing the hymn, Blue Boat Home, led by the First Unitarian Church of Oakland Chancel Choir. Yeah. 
Thank you to the choir for that incredible song. Dear ones, our time of worship has come to an end, but not the bonds of community that strengthen you. Every Sunday, each of us must face the infinite sea before us, knowing that we have a port to return to. As Stefan extinguishes our chalice and the two other candles, our closing words come from Brian Keeley, who writes, the chalice is extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and hearts and souls of each one of us. Let us carry the flame with us and share it with those we know, with those we love, and most importantly, with those we have yet to meet. Go in peace, return in love. Amen. <laughs>